I am your facilitator. Um, I work in the psychology department and I also consult with the Department of Athletics. Um, and I also, my third title, I work with the Opportunity Scholars Program, um, which is a learning community um, where we focus on smaller classrooms and really trying to engage students to, to be more active in their learning process. And so during the summer, we kind of talked about, uh, with Ruthie and some of the other staff here about you know, getting folks together to talk about ways to actively engage students better, because I think right now we're in a technology age where everyone is focusing on Twitter and Facebook and how to utilize those um, methods in classes, whereas some of us still want to, are concerned with just engaging the students every day. So I wanted to um, kind of have a discussion with you all. We're going to be interactive. We have lots of activities planned, so you can get some ideas on how to engage your students better, to keep them attentive. So everyone should have a name tag, right? And everyone has a name on it, right? And your discipline. You also have a colored dot. Oh, yeah. So what I'd like for you to do just for a couple of minutes is to um, find another person with the same colored dot. And I'd like for you to introduce yourself, tell them a little about what your discipline is and what you hope to learn from this discussion. So I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. Up and moving, gotta get up and moving. You can stay with your blue. <laughs> I think everybody's I think everybody's got a partner, so I think we're okay. Okay, about one more minute. Okay, you guys are good students. Follow instructions. Very nice. I have this quote up here. It says, I like a teacher who gives you something to take home besides homework. And so when you're thinking about ways to engage your students, you're trying to come up with things that will go with them, something that they can remember, the material. And, and I always believe that people remember what they experience and how they feel about something. Because I'm a psychologist, so I'm, I'm interested in how people feel. Um, but I do think that whatever your discipline, it can matter to the students if you make it interesting, if you make them want to care about it, okay? So our learning objectives for today, we're gonna to identify challenges. That's the first thing we're gonna do is 
what challenges you all have engaging your students in your classes. Secondly, want to learn specific teaching strategies to enhance your students' engagement. Thirdly, you're going to look at specific strategies to structure your courses to try to maximize student engagement. And then lastly, what I think is most important when we all come together and we're actually physically here, is to foster some networking. Other folks that have ideas and things to share. We've got lots of different types of experiences in the room. We have folks that have taught for a long time, some folks that are new to teaching, and people are changing disciplines. So I think we can learn a lot from each other. So I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to kind of meet with each other and talk so that we can share ideas. Okay? Everyone received a note card. So what I'd like for you to do first is on your note card is to write down three specific challenges you, ha you, you face when um, trying to engage your students. Three specific challenges in the courses that you teach. Okay, it's okay if you don't come up with three. Just try. try. Um, what's one, number one challenge you, you all face? Having everyone to participate in the group. Okay, getting everyone to participate in the group. Right here? Uh, getting them interested in what you're talking about. Getting them interested in what you're talking about. Okay, what class do you teach? Gotcha. What do you teach? Okay, and what do you teach? Um, educational psychology. And educational psychology. So getting them interested, getting them to care, and so on. And, and you all know, what's the typical style of teaching most of us do? Is that? Typical is lecture, right? And then what's another style we use? I know some of you teach labs as well. So you get to do some practical demonstrations and such. And so some of our biggest challenges are start with the students, right? Are they interested? This is not my major. I have to take this class. Okay, what are some other kind of demographics regarding the students that matter? Right here. Um, they're both very introverted. So they don't want to participate. They don't want to put their hand not up. Face -face. Not used to dealing face to face with people. Absolutely. Is another hand right here? Absolutely. So we're going to talk about small classes versus those large lecture type classes. Because that's a real challenge for a lot of folks. And how, how big is your lecture, your large lecture classes? Okay, 75, 77. Anyone teach a 300? Folks? I know, I was like, I was like yeah. But it's the, same, it's the same issue. Once you get over a certain number, you have to work a lot harder to try to engage the students. That's, but that's not necessarily true. Because how many of you had a class of 20 and you find it's hard to engage them? Uh-huh. What's some of your struggles? <laughs> so you teach a language. Yes. So I've heard folks say, gosh, I've got 10, 15 people. I thought it'd be easy to, and they're just all looking at it. Because now you've got a smaller number that's going to participate. So you may have one person who's dominating the conversation, but the rest of them are kind of like, okay, let him talk. Go ahead and let him talk. And it also depends on your subject, how comfortable people are. Secondly, I have up here technology. Did you, anyone you write anything related to technology down? Mm -hmm. uh, my students are on cell phones all the uh, mm -hmm. they, you know, they, they act like you can't see them. <laughs> Don't we always see it? Yeah. And doesn't it just irritate you to no end? Okay. And not just cell phones, but what else? 
laptops, tablets, those are just as distracting. Not just for them, but who else? All the people around them. And sometimes you as well. Okay. Um, what about, um, I'm sorry, did you have a hand up? Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right, that's why we have a contract with the students. The syllabus is your contract. And so, yes, bending the rules, not wanting to, and our, yeah, why not? Can't you do it for me? Okay. So, again, kind of their motivation, their attention to detail, how conscientious are they? Um, and there's other kind of demographics that we have to also be concerned with, you know, age differences in our classroom. We have traditional students, non-traditional students, um, students that have different, I guess, activity requirements, which changes their level of attendance. So there's lots of things that are going on with each individual student that affects their engagement, correct? What about, and I have on here, other forms of education choices. Any of you teach an online class? Okay, good because you all want to engage the students better. The problem with right now the online classes is it allows students to do things on their own pace in some respects, but they don't have to engage the same way. So if you've got a student that's taking two other online classes, they're sitting in your class like, well, go ahead, teach me. Hurry up. Work with me, you know, because they're, they're expecting the same level of interaction. So we need to understand that there are a good bit of challenges that we are facing. So by the way, I'm gonna collect your cards because I want to make sure we, we can do a tabulation of all of our different challenges. Okay? So let's talk about this for a moment. How many of you have a teaching philosophy? Okay, see so somebody going, hmm. So this is essentially why are you teaching? What is your purpose when you're you're going into the classroom every semester? Okay? And so a nice definition is it self-reflective statements related to your beliefs about teaching and learning. Okay? So at some point what I would suggest is sit down. It's kind of like if you're going to start a business, you do a business plan. If you're going to be a teacher, a lecturer, instructor, professor, have some idea about why you teach what you teach and what is it that you're trying to accomplish. Because that matters. Because if you go into the classroom and that instructor, I was just handed this class last week, and so, okay, let's get started. Students know if you're not invested in what you're teaching. And what happens if the, if the students feel you're not invested? Then they won't be. Okay? So sitting down and figuring out, not just writing your syllabus, but really kind of capturing kind of in your head, what is it that I want to accomplish at the end of the semester? How will I know if I've accomplished those goals? Okay, so what are your objectives? Some of my thoughts about teaching, I teach four psychology courses. Some of my thoughts are, I don't want students to just memorize material and, and give it right back to me. I like psychology because it applies to all of us. Doesn't matter your discipline. I feel like every student should walk out of there saying, how does this apply to me and my life? And so whether it's personality, whether it's watching sports, whether it's just understanding the brain and neuroscience, or even sexual behavior. I want you to learn something about the discipline, but also how it relates to you and your life. Okay? So I want you all to think about, for a moment, how you typically organize your class. If you had to put a percentage on how much you did the following, what would it look like? What percentage are lecture? What percentage is activities? What percentage is discussions? What, what percentage is student-led discussions or any other kinds of things that might be going on? Don't include exams, though. We'll take exams out. So see if you can come up with a percentage for how you typically organize your class.
Okay, so what is the biggest percentage on your paper? You said activities? And what do you teach, sir? Is that the lab? Yay, yay for the labs. So activity, hands-on, doing something interactive. See, y'all are lucky. <laughs> How big is your lab classes? Uh, oh, wonderful. 24. Okay. You say what? <laughs> it's easy. But that makes it a lot easier if you're in, a, in an environment where it's conducive for people to move around. How many of you have a class in one of those great, I love our buildings, don't get me wrong, but the chairs don't move, the desks don't move, the students are sitting like this. How conducive is that to doing activities and discussions? Makes it, makes it kind of difficult, but we have to work with what we have, correct? So what's the highest percentage of lecture for most folks? Are we at 50%? 60? Anything higher? 70. 70? Okay, anything higher than 70? Okay, and what's your discipline, Dave? Physics. Physics, oh yes, yes, yes. Okay, and so what is our next highest percentage? So if lecture is number one, activity over here, number two. <laughs> activity, discussions. So let me say discussion is their next highest, okay? What about student-led activities or discussions? Mm, yeah, so, okay. And any others? What's some of the others that you all may have in your classes? Guest speakers, presentations, okay? So when you're thinking about organizing your class, most of us organize our time around how much time we're going to lecture. And that's kind of the crux of what we do. Okay? Even when you're structuring lab activities, you're still having to facilitate. So you're the person in charge. You're the person coordinating. So it's an activity, but it also is kind of it's guided kind of in a lecture. This is the expert format. Okay? And so if we want to engage students, I say we start with the first class. We have to set the stage. Okay? How many of you will learn all your students' names? Okay? That's the first order of business. And in large classes, and we go back to, that's great in a small class, a lot easier in a small class. In a large class, is it possible, feasible, you're going to learn 300 students' names in the first few classes? No. You're lucky if by the end of the semester, you know probably half or a fourth, okay? So the strategy for engaging students in a small class, name tags. Name tags are cheap, name tags are easy, okay? Um, gave you a specific strategy of putting little colored dots on them. So you can have them, you can kind of assign them to groups without them knowing. Quick and easy strategy. You can do introductions. I know a lot of our language classes use introductions because you got to learn how to say your name in the language and a little bit about you, okay? You can, in some of my larger classes, especially, I'll take, for instance, my sports psychology class, I want to know what students are there, what's their discipline, and why they're taking the class. Because I have to, it's an interdisciplinary class. So I may have folks from nursing, from broadcast journalism, from psychology, from exercise science. I can go on, history, political science. So I want to know who all is in the class so I can tailor certain information so that they're, what, engaged. Because if I have a bunch of students that are in broadcast journalism and I never talk about media's influence on sports, first of all, I'm not doing my job because media's influence on sports is huge. But that speaks directly to them and how things are being reported, what's of interest to fans and coaches and athletes and so on. And so finding out who's in the class is really important, depending on your topic. Now, this is your major, and you have a, you're a major class. You still want to know why they're taking it, even if they just say, I'm taking it because it's part of my major. Because that tells you a little bit about their level of motivation. Okay? And so learning a little bit about your students First of all, shows them that you're interested. Shows them that you care. Shows them that you're prepared. And they're going to be a little more willing to be engaged with you. So your first class, you can set that stage. Question. Something I just left us to teach you in a small class, but I might be well right now like that, but I don't know. 
Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Perfect example. We call those icebreakers. We do those in all of our workshops and retreats that we all go to. They say do icebreakers because it makes you what? Makes you get to know each other and it makes you comfortable. Why don't we do that in classes? That's a perfect example. Tell us something interesting about you. Okay, right here. Mm-hmm. 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 Right. Right. And, and big classes don't have to be big classes in the eyes of the professor or in the eyes of the student. It's all in how you approach the class. And I, although I don't like teaching the big, big, big classes, I do have a class that could be 300, 250, 150, and I still will work twice as hard trying to get to know names. Same kind of thing as I do writing assignments where I can kind of start pa pairing up their opinion with the student. Name tags I've done in some classes, but just an effort to try to get to know the students. And if you have a student that's in, been in a number of your classes, acknowledge that student. Good to see you again, nice to see you again, that kind of thing. Because again, they'll, they want to take you because you are the ones that care, okay? But icebreakers are a fantastic way. And there's a ton, go on the internet, Google icebreakers, you get a ton, all different kinds of exercises. You can break them up into groups. You can do quick, simple ones, you know, who has a dog, and what's your dog's name? And there's all kinds of things that you can do just to get them interested. Now some folks will say, oh, but that's taking up good class time. Do it at the front end, it'll help you in the back end. If you want those students to engage, taking the time to get to know them or at least showing that this is going to be an interactive class. We're going to have discussions, we're going to have activities. For example, let's try this real quick. Okay? Doing those things at the front end will help you tremendously. Okay? So lots of, oh, I should say seating chart. Okay, seating chart. I've seen some classes do a seating chart. That's helpful, actually, because when students sit in the same place every day, we get to know who they are. And <laughs> I actually did an experiment in my class this morning. I found that the first three rows were the most interactive of the whole class, found that they were dominating the class. So on Friday, I said, hmm, can we switch the first three rows and the back three rows? They didn't like it, but after class this morning, wow, heard a lot of different opinions. New people talked. Imagine that. By putting the people that were dominating the discussion in the back, changed the dynamic of the class. Like, ooh, we have to do that again. I should have done it earlier. Because I want that involvement from everybody. And you all know, once a student decides or figures out they can dominate the class, they will. And what does that do to the rest of the students? They shut down. And they'll let that student dominate, okay? How many of you take attendance? Okay. So taking attendance in various forms can be helpful in getting to know the students. Okay. Um, small classes, I know some teachers still call roll. Other classes use classroom management systems like clickers. Other folks will pass around an attendance. So there's lots of ways that you can do it. Some people do it randomly. Some people take attendance by doing written assignments in class or quizzes. So there's lots of ways that you can still put that name and face, name and face on a constant basis. We learn it as we see it more and more. Okay? So we did the icebreakers. And even just asking them what they think the class is about. An interesting question at the very beginning of class. Sit down, talk to your neighbor. What do you think this class is going to be about? And see if they can come up with a response. For me, with my personality class, what do you think personality is? What do you think influences it? See what they come up with. Then we can have an open discussion, our introduction. To me, that's chapter one taken care of right there. Didn't have to lecture on it, but we can have a discussion about all the potential influences on personality, the history, where it came from, what we think about it. 
Okay. So let's talk about some specific teaching strategies. So again, small classrooms, lots of different kinds of things you can do. Large classes, it takes a little more time and effort. Okay? So if we're going to lecture, there's a strategy to using lecture. How long can you all hang on and when someone's talking to you before you start drifting off? <laughs> He's like, oh, you shouldn't have asked that question. Okay, kind of the maximum is 20 minutes. And so if you are trying to lecture for that hour and 15 minutes straight, you've lost the students after the first 20 minutes. We all kind of check out. So break your class up into meaningful bites. We call that chunking. So after 15 minutes, do a demonstration. Do an activity. Have them do a one minute paper or something to that effect. Ask them questions. Have them write down, index cards are cheap, y'all. I, I swear I've taken stock in them. Bring index cards, pass them out, write down a question you might have about what we've discussed. Anonymously, turn it in, and you can go back over them. See where people are lost, okay? But after 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, stop, do something different. Then go back to like video clip, music, was talking about um, arousal regulation in my sport class last week and talking about ways that you can psych yourself up. The whole room jumped when the sandstorm music came on. Class is at 8 o'clock in the morning. They were all, okay, they're all awake. Back to the theory. <laughs> Back to what we're talking about. Quick and easy things that you can do to keep the lecture lively. Okay? What kind of activities can you use? Oh, there's a nice long list. And a lot of these things don't have to cost money. And I know a lot of us are, are worried about the budget and we can't get supplies and so on. A lot of these don't cost you any money. Um, I tell students, I used to bring paper for the students to write on so I had nicely color coded and I knew exactly what we talked about on what day. That cost too much money. They bring their own paper now. <laughs> Everyone take out a piece of paper. Keep it handy. We're going to do some reactions later on. You know, there's an activity coming up. Okay. Do lots of surveys in class, okay? Surveys keep you kind of awake. Oh wait, what are, what are people saying? What are people wondering, okay? So utilizing those activities, demonstrations, our lab courses, but also in our lecture courses, we can do demonstrations. How many of you walk around when you're teaching? Yeah, if you walk around, they have to follow you. It keeps them awake. How many of you like your students to fall asleep? Pet peeve, can't stand it. I teach eight o'clock classes, can't stand it. You're gonna stay awake, you're shaking your head at me. <laughs> Gotta stay awake. So incorporating different kinds of activities. Um, how many of you use current events in your classes? So utilizing current events makes them pay attention, number one, to the news, and then how does it apply to class? When you're talking about ways to engage them, you can do simple demonstrations. I carry around, it doesn't always look like this, but I always have what's in my big bag, a bag of supplies. I've got markers, I have index cards, I have the dry erase markers, always something handy to use in class. Plus I don't always know what the classroom's gonna have, so. Carrying it around, so if we wanna do an exercise and I need to write up on the board, I don't wanna walk up to the board, well, Kirsten, there's no board. I wanna walk up to the board and say, oh, there's no markers. So does that mean now I can't do my exercise, that I need to write out things, okay? And sometimes by putting it up on the board, kind of old school chalkboard, dry erase board, not just PowerPoint, not just document camera, it also engages them. Sometimes I have the students go up and write on the board. And I have enough pens that I can have multiple students come up and write. And then that, that allows me to move around and facilitate while they're writing up on the board. And I can move all the way to the back and I can still direct and facilitate. And sometimes what happens, the students then start to lead the discussion while they're up there. Because they might know something about this topic and then they start injecting their opinion and what about this and so on. So again, lots of strategies, okay? Ooh, discussions. How do you control a discussion? First of all, have in your mind a time limit of how long a discussion is gonna go. 
Generate your questions. A good discussion question is always open-ended, right? What happens, that wasn't an open-ended question, I said right. Because <laughs> what happens if you ask a closed-ended question where they can either just say yes or no? You've closed your discussion, okay? So sometimes you might even want to ask, well, kind of try to identify three ways or five ways. Give them a target to work with. I'm not going to grade you if you didn't get all five, but at least you're attempting to, to hit that mark. Okay? Discussion should always be around the topic. If it starts to get off track, what do you do? You want to encourage the participation and then redirect it back to the topic. Okay? If you have that one student who's constantly, what do you do? What do you do? That's what you want to say. <laughs> but what, what, what do you say? Exactly. We have to move on. I, I want to hear from some folks over here, especially if you have a side of the room that's particularly quiet. So redirecting that discussion, not discouraging the participation. And, and I have a student that I just love dearly because I've, I've had him in a number of classes. But at the beginning of the class, the very first day, we had an agreement. Well, you have one question today. Because otherwise, he is that type of student, and he knows it, that he will dominate that class. Just with random, sometimes on point, sometimes random. But you want other people to be able to participate. Okay? What happens if you've got a touchy subject that you're trying to discuss? Always introduce, this is a touchy subject. We need to be respectful in our comments. No personal attacks, and so on. So always making sure that everybody in the class feels comfortable in what you're talking about. Okay? And then also, what I like to see is, is putting students in charge of these discussions. In some classes, that could be around a debate. In some classes, it could be putting up a math problem and letting them show how to work it. Could be in lab, showing how to work through the demonstration, the experiment. And in one of my classes, we did role plays and had a couple of the student athletes stand up and demonstrate how they stay focused while they're doing a particular sports skill. A whole lot further than me just telling you about it. And then they were able to ask questions. Well, how do you stay focused when the crowd is cheering you? Or how do you stay focused when it's the last few moments of the game? And they can show you and they can walk you through what they're thinking and they're feeling and so on. So that's a student-led, that's just taking a volunteer who's willing to Sure, I'll try it. What do you need me to do? Role plays in class. Immensely effective. Especially if you, you hand them what they're supposed to do, and they have to then kind of describe. Act like this person. Act like a, a couple who is arguing over, and then let them go with it. And then you talk about the theory related to it. OK? So lots and lots of things that we can do to, to build that engagement. So I, I have then termed the student engaged teaching is the, is the long, nice long laundry list of activities. Um, I personally like the classroom response systems. I have found that in the large classes it is absolutely valuable. Okay? What I have found, and I have to say in one of my classes I teach the hum psychology of human sexual behavior, and I had been using the clickers with all my classes, I was like, oh, it's pretty good, kind of cute. But when I asked and walked them through a discussion about abortion, and when it came down to them voting on whether or not they would have one under these circumstances, the clicker was the most valuable thing I've ever used to get an honest answer, anonymous. People put it, everyone was shocked, because you can see the results of what the class's response is. So to me, student engagement, you can, you can do a lot with a classroom response system. Okay? There's no way you would have gotten that with raising hands, you, you could not have gotten that from them writing their responses, but when you gave them the scenario and they were given the question, and it's anonymous, you got an interesting answer. Okay? Classroom surveys are also very effective, and you can do that a number of ways. Paper and pencil, online. You could do online surveys these days and bring the results to class. Students love to hear about themselves. They love to see what each other think what other people are feeling and their attitudes and such, okay? 
Classroom debates are also very good. Giving them the opportunity to research a topic. And this is where I have to say I have utilized people bringing their laptops, people who have access to the internet. You all have five minutes to construct a debate. People on the laptops start going. That's fine. Utilize your resources. Sometimes people are bringing in the textbook online. And they can flip to the, the portion in, on, their, on their iPad of that chapter we're working on. So I don't, I, I don't completely say don't open them, don't use them. But let's use them kind of appropriately. Okay? Use of role plays. Another nice thing to do is lecture starters. This is where, to me, your current events come in. What's, what, the question I ask in my sport class every day is, what's happening in the sports world? And we list out on the board kind of significant events that have happened. And inevitably, it translates nicely into whatever we're talking about for the day. It doesn't matter if the Giants won the World Series or Florida lost. It all transforms nicely into whatever it is we're talking about. Okay? Think, pair, share is a technique that if you pose a question, you have folks think about it and write it down. Then you have them pair with another person. I typically use your neighbor. That's great for the big classes. And share your responses. And so then what happens when you have a greater classroom discussion, if you don't get to everybody, everybody still has had an opportunity to share their responses. So then you can kind of talk with some folks, get a general idea of kind of what people thought. But at least the students are starting to get engaged, and they're meeting people in class. That's another big complaint about our large classes. I don't know anybody. How do I ever get time to meet anybody? Okay? So think, pair, share is a really easy way to see if they're understanding a concept, see what they think about something. Okay? Use of classroom presentations. How many of you utilize classroom presentations from students? Okay? Another effective way. Students don't always like them, but when they have to teach the class on a topic, they actually do a pretty good job. I've had some students developing um, presentations around important psychological studies that have been done over time. They've been fabulous. I was like, you're doing a better job than a lot of professors I've seen. Explaining the nature of the study, who the, who the theorist was, the population they used, the, the problems they found, the issues with the research. That's what we want. We want the students being able to synthesize that information, critically think about it, and then you know they've learned it if they can teach somebody else. Okay? How many use case studies in class? Case studies are another beautiful example of, of applying the information, making the students care about it. Okay? And so a lot of folks will say, but no, you can only use case studies in, in, in the social sciences. You know, we can't really use those in other places. I love the math teachers that can use real life examples and make math matter to folks. To me, that's the value of the teacher being able to apply that information to my daily life. Why should I care about biology? Well, <laughs> well why should I care? Okay. Give them a problem to solve. So not just a math problem, but it could be a societal issue. See what they can come up with. If you had all the resources in the world, what would you do to solve this problem? Get them in a group, have them generate, and then what are some of the challenges or what are some of the problems with what you've come up with? So again, getting them to engage. A lot of these strategies don't have to take more than 10, 15 minutes. That's where a lot of people get real concerned about class time. But to me, if you cut down your lecture, you, you hit the main points of your lecture, and you let them experience what you're talking about, they will get more out of the whole class than if you had lectured for the full time. Okay? Uh -huh. Then there's the games. Has anyone ever used something like Jeopardy in class? You know, PowerPoint and some of the other systems have Jeopardy screens that you can put in quiz, que quiz, can say it, quiz questions. And then they have fun with it. There's also, again, using your dry erase boards, you can play Pictionary or that win, lose, or draw, where they're having to draw different things. Great for anatomy. See what that looks like. And see if they can guess it. Okay. Um, another example would be scavenger hunts. 
Again, being creative. Something they could do outside of class and they could do inside of class. Scavenger hunt could simply be finding the main points of this theory. See if you can identify it. Okay? So again, being creative and doing some things that are different. Classroom demonstrations. So our lab folks have an upper hand. For us, it's bringing in all of our materials into the class. But the demonstrations, again, stick with folks longer. Demonstrations could be, say, for instance, identifying different smells in cognitive um, neuroscience. How do we smell? How do we detect different smells? Bringing in different smells and letting them do that. Blindfold them. Do lots and lots of different kinds of things. Bringing in guest speakers. How many utilize guest speakers in your classes? And you do have to be careful when choosing your guest speakers. You want to vet them a little bit. Make sure that they can engage the students and they're going to teach this, the class in the way that you want them to convey information. But the guest speakers sometimes are more valuable when you actually have a person who's experienced what you're talking about. And so what I do, I don't, just don't have students listen to the guest speaker and go home. They have to write a reaction. So I want them to not only listen to the guest speaker and what the person or the people have to say, but what's something you got out of it? How do you think it applies to class? Even tell me if you like the person in terms of, should I use them as a guest speaker again? Is that valuable to know? Absolutely. Because if I hear students really didn't get what I wanted them to get from a speaker, I won't use them again. Okay? But, you don't, but not being afraid to use guest speakers and making sure that they are conveying what you want them to convey. What about out-of-class assignments? I call them field exercises because I like to send folks out to the field technically. So that could be going to uh, your local pharmacy and checking out the feminine products aisle for my sexual behavior class. That might be going and observing a sport. That's a hard one, I know. Going to observe a sport or observing children in sport and then coming back to class and reporting their findings. That's very interesting, very important to them. It's one thing for me to tell folks about children in sports and all the issues regarding children in sports, coaches and parents and so on, or for them to go and actually witness it. And then that for them to talk about, and I sat next to this parent who I swear their child was in the NBA, you know, just, or the next stop is the NBA. And for them to then convey that information is, is more powerful than me telling them that's how it is. Okay. And then there's also field trips. We can go on field trips. <laughs> You're shaking your head. <laughs> we can do it. I've taken folks to the mental health department to observe what it's like. You can do it. It's it to take a little more time and effort, absolutely. But is it powerful, observational learning, actually seeing something real? Absolutely. Okay. So some other things to kind of think about are active learning strategies. Okay? So to kind of, I know we're getting short on time. So in terms of trying to, again, engage them in the process, and this is good for a lot of our science classes, getting them to generate their hypotheses. So you pose an issue, pose a problem, let them work on generating some hypotheses. See what they come up with. What kind of study would they want to do and why? Especially when you're talking about research and what's been studied, well, help them generate their own thoughts. Okay? Brainstorming, another useful strategy. Helping them to understand or just what's everything possible that comes to mind on a particular topic. And then you pool those. I love using the dry erase boards. Load it up and see what people think. Okay? Using the one minute questions is another way to break up your lectures. So you just pause. Okay, throughout a question, you have one minute to respond and see what they think. And you could do that again multiple times throughout the course. What's also kind of nice is those could also be questions that show up on exams. And so those are questions that don't show up on the lecture notes. Those are questions that they will remember more because they had to think about it and react to it in class, respond to it in class. And the other thing is not everything has to go on lecture notes. In class stuff can be part of you want them to learn. Okay? So sequencing, which means again you've planned ahead and you're pairing things up so they match each other. They're going in a sequence. And so at the end of the class, things have gone in a particular sequence, and you're like, that's what I wanted you to get out of it. 
And so for the example that um, I could give is you could be talking about one topic, but your series of lecture activities, lecture activities all go in sequence. So at the end of the day, you've conquered your goal of what you wanted them to learn. Okay. Helping them make decisions, another strategy. Another interesting strategy, I see tutors use this a lot when, kids, when students go to tutoring, is concept mapping. Have them sit down and okay, give them this theory and see if they can conceptually map it out. Okay, so when we're talking about principles of reinforcement, negative reinforcement would be over here, positive reinforcement's over here, but actually they're, they're similar because you're trying to increase the likelihood that behavior is going to occur. But this is different from punishment. I mean, so you have them map it out, okay? Helping them to solve a problem, and then lastly, making it personal. Help them find some personal connection to what they're working on, okay? So lastly, just to promote student engagement, we want to make sure we're enhancing our students and their self-belief. Can they learn this material? Is it something they're interested in? But we want to encourage them to work collaboratively as well as independently, okay? And we want to make sure you all know that your job, your role is crucial to this process. How much students are engaged will depend on you. And like we said, if you're coming in prepared, you're coming in interested, you're coming in energetic, they'll want to learn from you, okay? And you want to create educational experiences that are challenging and enriching. So again, what do you want them to leave with? And then lastly, we know that our student population is diverse. And so we want to welcome that and utilize that as part of what you're doing. Okay? So as we engage students, we started with our teaching philosophy, developing our class objectives, first class, injecting our teaching strategies, and then when we get our course evaluations, go through them and think about what the students are saying. If there is a comment saying, I wish you would do more activity, think about that. And, and, and think, because it may have only been one student that said that, okay? And then take that to your future planning for your course. If you're wanting to get students more engaged, that one student that may have been honest Maybe that key to your future planning. Okay, I'm well, finished. If you would like to stay and ask some questions and interact, feel free to do so. But we know some of you have mm -hmm. classes this week to get to. So yeah. You know, if you go ahead, but otherwise, I'll uh, rush in, but I'll just take up a class. Well, you have my my information if you have. Oh, thank you.